Welcome to Salem Chapel. If you're new with us, man, it's so great to have you as well. Along with our uh, family members here at Salem Chapel, and people call this place their home. I know it's not easy coming to a new place. I had the chance to meet some of you this morning. If you're watching us online, let me say welcome to you. Maybe you're checking us out. Uh, maybe you're sick. I don't know what the case may be. Vacation, whatever it is, man, we are glad that you're joining us as well. I want you to invite, invite you to turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3. If you are new with us, let me explain where we've been um, since uh, the middle of September. We've been walking through the book of Revelation, specifically chapters 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3, looking at these letters that Jesus has the apostle John pen as Jesus speaks to John what he wants to say to these seven literal specific churches that existed in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. And what we've been doing is we've been looking at these seven letters, the six this week, and then Lord Willem will close it out next week with the seventh letter. We've been looking at these letters and really allowing these letters to be a mirror that we stand front in front of as a church and really ask ourselves, God, as you write these things to these seven specific churches that existed some 2,000 years ago and still exist today, but as you wrote these things to these churches and you reminded them of what you want them to know, what you want them to be, what you want them to do, Lord, allow us as a church to look at these things and say, God, what do you want us to know as your church? What do you want us to be? What do you want us to to do. And so that's what we've been doing, which is why we entitled the, the series titled Salem, Dear Salem Chapel. Not that we're the only church, uh, by no means, but how are we responsible to take what God has said and apply it to the church that we are a part of? And so we've been doing that every week. Uh, before we get into this, these verses in verses 7 through 13, I want, you, I want you to answer this question just in your mind. I don't want you to raise your hand, but here's the question. How confident are you this morning? Are you confident? You're like, about what? Now, I just want you to think, are you confident? Like, are you a confident person this morning? Some of you, you need to be a little less confident every morning. Um, just to be transparent with you, uh, that's probably, others would say that's true of me. Some of you are, are, man, you struggle tremendously with having any confidence whatsoever. And so I want you to literally just answer that question in your mind. How confident are you today? Because I think a lot of times when we think about how we answer that question, we look to certain things to determine whether we are confident or whether we are not. Maybe we look at our experience. Maybe you have a job or, or something and you look at, at that role that you play in that workplace and you have confidence. And the reason why you have confidence is based on the experience that you have. Whatever it may be. You're like, you know, I've been doing this for a long time. So by because I've been doing this for a long time, I know what's expected. I've learned a lot. I know what to avoid. I know what to do. I know how to handle situations. So you may be sitting here this morning. You're like, you know, I'm feeling pretty confident going into this week. Or you may be like, you know what? I've got certain talents, certain abilities. And because of those talents and because of those abilities, I have a certain confidence. So Johnny, when you ask that question, I would say, you know what? I'm feeling pretty confident. Maybe that's because of your talent. Maybe it's because of your relationships. And you're like on cloud nine right now because you're in a brand new relationship. And everything you know, you see in rose colored lenses and you're like, just like, like everything's amazing. And you would say, man, I'm feeling confident today because of the relationship that I may be in. We can go on and on and on, but I wonder this morning, are you confident? And if you are, why? And if you're not, why? Came across this individual just randomly as I was just doing some research about confidence. Uh, there was this individual uh, that existed, um, in the uh, World War I time of France, and he was the French prime minister, and his name was George Clemenceau. Okay, there's a picture of him. Um, he fought many duels with various rivals. So what you need to understand, if you're not familiar with history, like gentlemen used to duel when they had a significant disagreement. What that meant is they had two pistols, and they would literally walk so many paces, and they would try to shoot each other. 
And obviously, if you get hit, you die or wounded deeply. Doesn't sound like a gentleman's thing at all. Thank God that we didn't live back then, right? But nevertheless, this guy had done quite a few of them. I mean, if you got a mustache like that, you've got to have some confidence, right? Uh, let's just put his picture, keep his picture up there. Yeah, there it is. Um, this is what I thought was interesting. On one occasion, I, I came across this. He surprised his second by asking the attendant at a Paris railroad station for a one-way ticket to the duel. So his assistant, he said, hey, just give me a one-way ticket. I'm headed to this duel, another one. Um, and the assistant said, isn't that a little pessimistic? Like, seriously, you think you're going to die, so you only want a one-way ticket? Well, this is what Clemenceau said. He replied, not at all. I always use my opponent's return ticket for the trip back. <laughs> like, that's some serious smack talk. Like, I saw it. I actually laughed out loud. I was like, ooh, I like this guy. I mean, once again, if you're going to have that stash, you've got to have a sense of confidence. This morning, what we are going to be talking about is confidence. So the title of the message this morning is this, Jesus is your confidence. Not your experience, not your talent, not your job. We're going to think about Clemenceau, not how good a name you got in the next duel you're rolling up to, like not your your relationships, not that any of those things that I just mentioned are bad things in and of themselves. But this morning, what we're going to look at is this idea that Jesus is your confidence. So let's read verses 7 through 13. Hopefully you've gotten there by now. You got it pulled up on your phone, your device. Maybe you've got an actual Bible in your lap. If you don't have any of those things, it'll be on the screen. But I do want you to turn there if you can. Verse 7 says this. I'm reading out of the Christian Standard Bible. Write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. So let me state the obvious this morning. We're not talking about Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Okay, Uh, but there was this city named Philadelphia. Let me just give you a little bit of context about this city because it will help us understand what we're going to look at today. Philadelphia was actually founded by the king of Pergamum. Remember, we talked about that city a few weeks ago that Jesus writes to, and his name was Attalus Philadelphus. So when he founded this city, he named this city after himself, Philadelphia, Philadelphia coming from the Greek word for love, specifically brotherly love. It was the newest of these seven cities that we've been looking at. It's the newest of the city. It was the smallest city of all of these cities. But what was interesting about this city is it was situated strategically because it was at the hub of many of the trade routes that would really open up to the rest of the Far East. And so it was known as a gateway town. It was a gateway to the East. And because it was a gateway to the East, it was also really a gateway for Greek culture. Up to this point, all the other cities really were were embedded with Roman culture, but Philadelphia was a little bit different. It was more open It didn't have some of the religious things entrenched in in terms of pagan idolatry. It was more open to religious, other religious ideas because it was newer, because it was smaller, because it was a gateway to the East. That's important for us to understand. And you'll find out why here in a moment. Let's, let's continue. It says, thus says the one, the holy one, the true one, I'm reading out of verse seven, the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close and who closes and no one who opens. We'll come back to that because that's significant when we're gonna look at this morning. Verse eight, I know your works. Jesus says, look, I have placed before you an open door that no one can close because you have but little power, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Note this, I will make those from this synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews and are not, but are lying. I will make them come and bow down at your feet and they will know that I have loved you. Because you've kept my command to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come on the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. The one who conquers, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God and he will never go out again. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. Let anyone who has ears to hear, listen 
to what the Spirit says to the churches. This morning, Salem Chapel, we need to listen to what God is saying to us today. Here's the idea that I want us to get this morning. And I entitle it, as Dear Salem Chapel, every idea that we've looked at in this series because we're allowing God's word to be a mirror for what he wants us to be as his church. Dear Salem Chapel, Jesus is your confidence to do this, to open doors that are locked and to lock doors that need to be closed. He's your confidence. But in relation to what? In relationship to the doors that are locked, that need to be opened, and the doors that need to be shut. I want to remind ourselves of something today before we get into this text and unpack it, that your confidence and my confidence in Jesus just doesn't come by me hearing more about Jesus. No, I'm not minimizing that we need to hear, that we need to learn about more about Jesus. But some of us, man, we watch messages on YouTube. We listen to podcasts about Jesus and about the things of Jesus. We come to church every week. We're in a life group. I mean, I mean, we, we couldn't pack more Jesus into what we're exposed to if we tried. But it's not enough to hear about it. That's not really what increases our faith. Here's what increases our faith or confidence in Jesus. It's when we're obedient to what he says based on who he is. See, as we read just this church in Philadelphia, we can frankly say every church. Here's what I want us to understand, and maybe you need to write this down. It's not on the screen. That God's promises put into practice is what produces perseverance. It's not enough to know about them. It's saying, I'm going to take those things of God that I'm learning about him and who he says he is, and I'm going to actually put them into practice in my life. And when I do that, you know what happens? It produces perseverance. Why? Because I'm taking what I know and what I know I need to know and what I know needs to be implied to my life. But I'm not just hearing it. I'm actually taking it and I'm applying it. And when I do that, that's how I get stronger. That the result is perseverance. And you see the emphasis on obedience here, which is so important. But what I love is we're coming to a close of this series. And what I want to remind us of as we talk about Jesus being our confidence is when we look at every single letter, all seven of them, when Jesus starts off his letter, you know what he does? He reminds them of who he is. Because he knows that you need to be reminded of who I am so that your obedience is not based on any other motivation than based on who I am. So what you do is based on who I am and what I say I'm going to do. Let me just give you just a little synopsis of this, and you can take a screenshot of this or whatever because I'm going to go through this quickly. Let me just share with you in like a Cliff's Note version everything that Jesus has said about himself up to this point that we've looked at and are going to look at this morning. First of all, in Revelation 1, 12 through 17, the very first week of this series, Jesus reminds these churches of his majesty. He reminds them of his supremacy in chapter 2, verse 1. He reminds them of his victory in verse 8 of chapter 2. He reminds them of his capacity of what he's able to do in Revelation 2.12. He reminds them of his sovereignty, that he's over all things in verse 18 of chapter 2. He reminds them of his deity, that he's God in verse 1 of chapter 3. He reminds them, as we're going to look at today, of his authority. It's why we can have confidence in verse 7. He's going to remind them, as we're going to look at next week, Lord willing, in verse 14, to the church at Laodicea, of his dependability. What's the point? This morning, what we need to do is we need to remind ourselves of of who Jesus is. Because if my confidence is resting in anything else other than Jesus, I am not a secure person this morning. I am tremendously insecure. So let me ask you this. What door do you need Jesus to open? 
What door to you right now seems like there is a big, fat padlock on it and you need Jesus to open it? What door is it? Think about it. And let me ask this in reverse. What door in your life needs to be shut? What door in your life needs to be shut? And you've tried in your own strength over and over again to shut that door, but it keeps opening up. What door needs to be opened or what door needs to be shut? I want you to think about that. And if you have a pen this morning or you got your phone up, I actually want you to write that down, whatever it is. I'm gonna pause. I'm gonna take time because I think this is important because we need to have identified those things before we go any further in this message and in this text so that God can speak to whatever that is. So just take a moment, just yourself, I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna move on. God, every one of us in this room, watching online, listening later on during the week, wherever the case may be, have a door that we are praying that you would open, or we have a door that we know needs to be shut. And maybe if we have been wrestling with this for a long time, God, we are at a place where we realize that we can't do it on our own. And God, if we're not at that place, would you bring us to that place? But God, help us to walk out of here with hope. Help our confidence to be in you, that you are the one who can unlock what is locked and lock what needs to be shut. So God, we say here at Salem Chapel that when your word is open, your mouth is open. So God, it's not praying that you would speak to whatever door that is, but Lord, we are asking through your Holy Spirit that you would give us wisdom and ears to listen and confidence to obey. In Jesus' name, amen. Here's the question I want to ask this morning. How does Jesus give you confidence that he is able to open the doors that are locked, and lock the doors that need to be closed. How does he give you confidence? I'm going to give you three things, and I'm going to say them right now, all three, and then we're going to unpack them. First of all, Jesus' integrity gives you confidence. Jesus' reliability gives you confidence. And Jesus' authority gives you confidence. And we're going to spend most of our time on the third one, so let me give you the first one. Jesus' integrity gives you confidence. Here's why I say that. Because in verse 7, which is so foundational, and what is in verse 7 to the rest of these verses, Jesus describes himself first as the Holy One. And that term, the Holy One, speaks to something that is genuine, something that is authentic, something that is real. It speaks to uh, his per perfection. It speaks to his purity. It speaks to his integrity. So it's literally like Jesus is saying to this little church that has all of this opportunity based on where it's situated to be a mouthpiece for the gospel and to have tremendous influence to people that pass through it. He says, I first want to remind you that the reason why you can have confidence is because I'm the Holy One. It's because of my integrity, that I'm perfect, that I'm pure, that I can be trusted. Just think about this for a second. Because for those of us who've been in church for a long time, we just hear holy and we just kind of dismiss it and be like, oh yeah, I knew that already. I have no idea how that makes a difference. If Jesus, wasn't, if Jesus wasn't holy, if he wasn't perfect, think about this. 
We've got no reason to sing. We've got no reason to be here. Like you got up early for no reason whatsoever. Like you could be at lunch right now because if he's not holy, then his life and death was useless. Why? Because it was as good as me dying for you or you dying for my sins. Why is that useless? Because we're all sinful. But because Jesus is perfect, that means his life, death, and resurrection was not useless. If he wasn't holy, then guess what? His love for you can be flawed. I mean, I love my wife, Lori. I love my kids. I love this church. But I've got to check myself all the time because my love by nature is flawed. It's selfish. I'm naturally going to love me first before I love anybody else. And if Jesus wasn't holy, then this morning we can't absolutely trust that his love is not like yours or mine. If he's not holy, then his power could be something that could bring you harm rather than work all things together for good. Why? Because his power could be something that could be abused rather than something that is for your good. See, his holiness is significant. If he's not holy, then he can't be trusted. That even right now, in the midst of those doors that are closed for you right now, that you've been literally banging on them, asking for God to open what keeps me asking? What keeps me knocking? What keeps me seeking? Matthew 7. You know what it does? It is an understanding and a reminder from the Holy Spirit that I have a Jesus that has integrity because he's the Holy One. Do you see the significance of that? To us even being able to say that we can have confidence in Jesus? What about his reliability? Because Jesus' reliability gives you confidence. How is he described? He's not only described as the holy one, but he's described as the true one. This has the idea of his reliability, that he can be trusted, that he is who he says he is, that he is genuine, authentic, and real. So I want you to think about what you, if you're a confident person this morning, you said, Johnny, I'm feeling pretty good about myself. Like I had a good week. And I ask you, well, what do you think that's based on? Experience, talent, financial resources, relationships, job, whatever it is. I want you to think about those things and ask yourself this. Are those things reliable regardless of the obstacle? So let's just help us think through that. If it's my experience then something easily could happen that's beyond my experience and I can make some really bad decisions and all of a sudden, where does that leave me? That experience that I've been trusting in is, is now something that I'm not sure I can trust it because I've made some poor decisions. So really, it's not reliable regardless of the obstacle. What if I'm in a relationship and that relationship fails or, or someone sins one another in that relationship and that relationship doesn't get restored or becomes broken? Then all of a sudden, if all my confidence is in that thing, then it's not as reliable as I thought it was, is it? I'm going to go on and on with all the things. The bottom line is we got to ask ourselves, is what I'm placing my confidence in outside of Jesus, is it reliable regardless of the obstacle? How about, is it genuine? In other words, is there any bit of hint of weakness in it? Listen, I, I desire my wife, Lori, to have confidence in me. And, and I have confidence in my spouse. And I, and I want my kids to have confidence in me. And I want you to have confidence in me. That's how we're wired. We want that in one another. But the reality is is that I'm going to fail you, you're going to fail me, and I don't say that in a pessimistic way whatsoever, but just understanding I can't put those types of expectations of perfection on anyone else. Jesus is the only one who has no weakness, who is genuine, who is reliable regardless of the obstacle, who is truly authentic, and there's no facade whatsoever. Listen, you can ask me, Johnny, you've had a good week? And I can say, yeah, man, I had an awesome week with a big smile on my face. And it could be absolutely horrible. And I could be in the depths of despair. But I got a smile on my face because I know I'm supposed to. But only Jesus is reliable, completely, genuine, 
and completely authentic. And Jesus' point is to this church that is facing persecution and also facing opportunities. Church, my integrity gives you confidence. My reliability gives you confidence. Here's the third one that I want to spend the majority of our time. Jesus' authority gives you, gives me confidence. Can I just bring our, my, ourselves back to the last phrase in verse 7? Jesus says, the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close, and who closes and no one opens. Now, other places in the New Testament, Jesus is described as holding keys. Right? When he, when he defeats death and he's risen, he's speaking of the one who holds the keys. In Revelation 1, he's spoken of the one who holds the keys of heaven and death. In other words, through his life, death, and resurrection, he has the ability, he has the credibility to be the one to provide salvation, to provide eternal life with him forever. He has the keys to heaven and he has the keys to death. He has overcome spiritual death for me through his life, death, and resurrection. He has overcome physical death for me because when I die and die in this life, I am promised a life with him forever for all of eternity. So his life and death and resurrection has given him the keys of heaven and death. But here it's spoken of as he has the key of David. What's the significance? Significance is this. It's the idea that he's the master key holder. Why is he the master key holder? Because by saying he holds the key of David, it's symbolizing that he is the ultimate king. He's from the line of David. He has every right to be called king. And because he is the king, he is the master key holder. In other words, there is no lock that he can't unlock. And there is no door that he can't lock because of his authority. I love how we see here a difference in some way than the keys of heaven and death where we're like, yes, he has. We can trust him for our eternal salvation. But here we can trust him for the doors that need to be locked on this earth and the doors that need to be opened on this earth. He's writing to a church that has so much opportunity and potential to be a messenger of the gospel. And he wants to remind them, even though you're small, I'm not. He has the authority to unlock every door that is locked for you because he's the master key holder. So I wonder this morning, what door are you struggling to believe that he can't open, that he has the key to? Or maybe, what door are you struggling to believe that Jesus can lock? See, for you and for me, I think sometimes we, ha- we, we don't struggle, or we struggle less, I should say, with having confidence in ourselves, we actually oftentimes struggle more in having confidence in Jesus. Even though that sounds backwards, that's the reality. And I think it's interesting that Jesus even speaks to this church knowing that that's our human nature. Because our lack of confidence that a door can be opened or a door can be closed, I really think stems from two things that Jesus highlights in verses, in verses eight and nine. The first one is we can feel that way because we have a feeling of inadequacy. We're like, man, I've tried to open that door and it can't be opened. Or, or I realize that, that I don't have the ability, I don't have uh, the opportunity, um, I don't have the prowess, uh, I don't have the platform to open that door. And so our feeling of inadequacy, we can actually transfer to Jesus because we feel inadequate, therefore Jesus is inadequate. And I think Jesus understands that about our human nature which is why he says this in verse eight to this church. Look, I've placed before you an open door that no one can close because you have but little power. That word little literally has the idea of a scale. So in other words, on a scale from one to 10, one being the least, 10 being the most power, Church of Philadelphia, I know you're at a one. which is why I want you to remind yourself of that I have the authority. I'm the master key holder. 
I can open what you can't. And Salem Chapel, what we need to remind ourselves of, whatever the, whatever the door is that we see as being locked this morning, what gives you confidence that it can be opened is that Jesus is the master key holder. See, Church of Philadelphia, small little church, insignificant church, but can I remind ourselves of something this morning? Can I just speak to us corporately for a second? It's not the size of the church that determines its impact. It's not the size. Because sometimes we can get caught up in thinking, well, if we just had more people, if we just had more money, if we just had this, if we just had that, then all of a sudden, then we could have an impact in Winston-Salem and in the city and around the world. Sometimes churches can get caught up in that. And oftentimes the flip side is we can think to ourselves, well, because we're this size, because we have these facilities, because we have these resources, because we have these people that make up the church, therefore we can do amazing things for God and Jesus is way in the back. And I love how Jesus reminds this church, church at Philadelphia, yeah, you're small, yeah, you're little, yeah, you don't have a lot, but I want you to understand that I'm the one that's opened up this door of opportunity for you to be a tremendous witness for me in the gospel. I've placed you in this area of the world that allows you to be a place that's a bridge from what everyone knows to what maybe is not so known as they travel east to these new places and you are literally have this opportunity to be a representative of the gospel in a way none of the other churches can be because Jesus doesn't condemn this church at all he doesn't say anything that should bring conviction to this church nothing but what he does do is he reminds them of what he can do I wonder this morning, what are you minimizing of yourself that's causing you to believe that God can't use you? Oh, I'm not eloquent enough. Oh, I don't have the right pedigree. Oh, I don't have this. Oh, I don't have that. And Jesus is wanting to speak to your feelings of inadequacy and say, I'm the one who opens the doors. I wonder what door Jesus has already opened up for you that you are not even seeing because of your feelings of inadequacy. Sometimes we don't need to pray, God, open the doors that are locked. We need to pray, God, give me eyes to see the doors you've already opened. I wonder if that's us this morning. Feelings of inadequacy can come into play when we have little confidence. How about this? Our lack of confidence can also stem from a fear of opposition. Like we got people that are opposing what we're trying to do. It's not so much inadequacy. Maybe, maybe we, we understand and we're living into Jesus, our confidence, and we're being obedient and we're wanting to walk through the doors that maybe he's already opened or, or we're wanting to pray for those doors that are locked right now, but we keep praying, we keep asking, we keep seeking, we keep knocking and wanting the Lord to open those doors. But there's opposition that's coming at us that's getting us discouraged. Maybe our motives are being called into question. Maybe the things that we're trying to say are being called into question. Maybe you're at the workplace and you're like, man, I understand that this is my mission field and I understand I need to show people that I'm different because of Jesus' love for me and that I'm a follower of Jesus and not in a condemning way, but in a loving way. And, And I'm trying to do all the right things and for whatever reason, my motives are getting called into question by others working alongside of me and saying, well, you're just trying to be manipulative or you're just trying to to get an angle or you're just doing this so that they can think something much of you And and so those motivations are being called into question and you're facing opposition right now and you're trying to be faithful to the open door that he's given you. What we need to understand is this church is no different because the opposition that it was facing was from Jews, unbelieving Jews in the city. And so what they were doing is, is because These Jewish believers believed that Jesus was the Messiah, that he was the Lord and Savior. They were not allowing them to worship in the synagogue. And so they were facing opposition by being ostracized from their community. They were also 
having false accusations spread about them in the city and in the area. That was the opposition that they were facing. And I wonder if it's similar for you today. Satan, get this. I want you to understand this. Anytime you have thoughts of, I'm not good enough. God can't use me. Why do I keep trying? Those types of thoughts are never from the Holy Spirit. They are always from the enemy because Satan is an accuser of God's children. That's in Revelation 12. And unfortunately, we even have to be careful as followers of Jesus because sometimes the devil can use us to be the accuser of other people. Hello. But if we're sitting here this morning and we're struggling with confidence to believe that God can open doors or God can close doors or the confidence to walk through the door that we know he's already opened and you're like, God, not that door, please that door. It's either inadequacy or it's opposition. And what Jesus wants to remind ourselves today is that fear and unbelief, if that is what you're seeing life through, those lenses, fear and unbelief, you will only see obstacles. But when you're reminding yourself of who Jesus is, that's why we started there today. When we remind ourselves, it's not that we don't see the obstacles, but we also see the opportunities. And the opportunities we see as greater than the obstacles. Why? Because the Lord's the one who holds the key. And that key is the key that unlocks what is locked and it locks what needs to be shut. Listen, some of us in this room, the door that needs to be shut is the door of shame, the door of, the door of guilt, the door of pain, the door of regret. Because some of us, we, we close that door and then we allow the enemy to open that door and we allow him to remind ourselves, God can't use you because of what you did. God can't use you because of your shame. God can't use you because of your regret. God can't use you because of what happened six years ago that you can't get over. And what the Lord is wanting to remind us of today, maybe in this room, is it's time to allow Jesus to shut that door, to lock that door. Because I can tell you from experience, so often I allow the pain of the past to affect how I perceive the present. And I need to shut that door. Because I've seen God work the bad for the good and I've seen God orchestrate things. And yeah, those times were painful, but sometimes I just need to say, Lord, forgive me for not allowing you to shut that door. So some of us, maybe it's not the open doors, maybe it's the doors that need to be shut. But the point is this, Jesus holds the key for whichever that is. So I want to close this morning by just reminding us with what Jesus reminds this church in verses 9, 10, 11, and 12. Because this is what I love about Jesus. Is that Jesus is not someone who stands over here and we're way over there and he's like, okay, I'm just waiting I'm just waiting for you to wake up and smell the coffee, so to speak, and you realize that you can't continue on your own anymore, so I'm just waiting for you to come over to where I am because I ain't about to move over there. No, no, no. You need to come over here. No, unfortunately, that's how I act. But, but the grace and love and mercy of Jesus, you know what he does? He leaves the 99 and he goes after the one and he says, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna come to where you are and I'm gonna meet you in your feelings of inadequacy. And I'm gonna meet you in that opposition. And I'm gonna remind you of some promises that you can put into practice so that you can persevere. Can I give you three of them that he mentions? He says in verse nine, look at it. Note this, I will make those from the synagogue of Satan, those spreading those accusing lies of Satan who claim to be Jews and are not, but are lying. In other words, who claim to be a part of the Christian community, but are actually lying. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make them come and bow down at your feet and they will know that I have loved you. In other words, I'm gonna vindicate 
hate you. Yeah, they're spreading all this stuff about you, but you let me be your defense. You let me open that door. You let me close their mouths. What does he promise? He promises a promise of status. I'm the one who holds your reputation. Your reputation is based on me and you're worried about your status being taken away. No, no, no. I'm gonna promise you that I love your status more than you do. This morning, you need to maybe remind yourself of that. How about this? Verses 10 and 11, because you've kept my command to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is gonna come on the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. Now we can look at that. We can get caught up. Oh, oh, I was hoping Johnny would talk about this. When's the rapture gonna happen? Is it gonna happen before the tribulation, during the tribulation, after the tribulation? Some of you are like, I have no idea what the rapture is and what the tribulation is. That's okay. Here's the point. Jesus gives us a promise of security just like he does this church. And some of us, because of inadequacy or opposition, are feeling very insecure this morning. And what Jesus wants to remind you of is he is your security. How about this promise in verse 12? The one who conquers, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will never go out again. Here's the significance of that. This area of Philadelphia, this city, was in an area that had a lot of fault lines, which meant they had a lot of earthquakes. If you're from California, you can identify. And so when he gives this analogy that you will be a pillar that will not be shaken, It resonated with them. He took their circumstances and he used it to apply a spiritual truth that you are going to be a pillar. I'm promising you a promise of stability. I will write on him the name of my God. He says he will write on you the name of God, the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes out of heaven from my God. If you go to Revelation 21, we have this picture of this new Jerusalem coming down, this new kingdom that Jesus will set up where there'll be no more sin, there'll be no more pain, there'll be no more crying. And Jesus says that eternity, that promise that this world isn't going to be the way that it always is with its suffering and its pain and its wars and its disease and its prejudice and all of those things. But there's coming a day where I'm going to right all wrongs. And even though we've got to live in that day right now of all of those things, the promise of the future gives me hope for today. What does it give me? It gives me stability. Jesus has your status. Jesus has your security. Jesus is your stability. And he's coming to you right now and says, will you trust me? Will you trust me with that door that's locked? Will you trust me that I've closed that door of guilt and shame and regret? Stop trying to open it. Salem Chapel, Jesus is our confidence to open doors that are locked and lock doors that need to be closed. What's the door for you? God, I thank you today for your word. I thank you that when your word is open, your mouth is open. God, when we're talking about these types of things, God, it's not that it stops in our mind when we leave this place, but God, I pray that this word that we have looked at today would be something that we chew on, something that we preach to ourselves throughout the week when feelings of inadequacy or opposition come at us. May we remind ourselves that we are not confident because of who we are or what we've accomplished or what talents we may have or what relationships you blessed us with, but our confidence is bedrock in Jesus Christ, the one who holds the key. Lord, help us to be reminded of that, but to take that promise and to put it into practice so the results are our perseverance. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us this morning?